Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us once again. I know we had a little break last week, but we're back again. Um, today's webinar is called is How Good Leaders Create a Culture of Wellness, a case study from construction. And that's going to be presented by Janet McCulloch from Lysander. Um, I just want to let you know some housekeeping. There is a Q&A panel down here at the bottom of the webinar uh, panel software. Please use that to ask any questions and we'll get those answered towards the end of the session. If you want to chat directly to me, you can use the chat button, but be aware that you can also chat um, check, text everyone. I think Janet may actually invite some comments in that chat during the webinar. There'll also be a few polls. Please jump on those as soon as you can when they come up. They're, it's really good to get that engagement. Um, as with all our webinars, it's going to be recorded and later today we'll send out an email with links um, to, any, uh, to Lysander, um, Janet's organisation, and also to um, the podcast and recording. So um, just a little bit about Janet. With um, Janet has technical experience in executive leadership, culture change, safety and strategy. Um, Janet's extremely well positioned to provide commentary on what is needed to afford achievable and sustainable change in wellness across the infra infrastructure and construction industry. Supported by theory distilled from a master's in change and consultative practice and ongoing dialogues with senior stakeholders, Janet brings a practice approach to the realities of driving change in an industry that is already under pressure to perform on high visibility projects. Over to you. Thanks for joining us today, Janet. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thank you all for dedicating some time to continuing the conversation about wellbeing. Um, it's one of those times, particularly as most of us probably have, well, you probably have one ear on me and one ear on the news about whether or not there's another lockdown or whatever else. But what it has done, um, one of the few good things that's probably come out of COVID for a lot of us is that it's brought the conversation about mental health and wellness to the boardroom table. So really for a lot of organisations, it is the topic of the month, if not for the last 12 months not only from the economic realities of what it's doing to business, but also in how each one of us is being impacted in the way that we bring ourselves to work, the way that we connect with our friends, the way that we have conversations with loved ones. So it really is a good time for us all to be pursuing uh, the case of wellness and to be looking at it, particularly in relation to what this means in our workplace. So thank you for dedicating some time to continuing that conversation. When we talk about wellness, what is it? And I really like the Global Institute of Wellness definition on this because it talks about the active pursuit of activities, choices and lifestyles. Now that has an implication around it being a personal responsibility. But if we take it a little deeper, we also see that wellness is influenced by things like the physical environment about us, the social connections we have, the cultural environment in which we live and work, and therefore, it becomes the responsibility of organisations, of leaders, of safety professionals, and of everyone else. So this is where the topic of this conversation, you know, what good leaders can do in the, in, in the wellness space is really important for us. So let's start with a practice poll almost. So I'll get Sarah to launch the first poll now. Is mental health and wellbeing an important issue in your organisation? And what that can mean is, do you have regular conversations about it? Is it on the agenda at your boardroom level? You know, to what degree um, is it taken seriously so that people feel that they can actually speak up about how they're feeling? So this is really what we're looking at at this point. So is mental health and wellbeing an important issue in your organisation? Okay, I think I can end that and show the results now, Janet. Thank you, Sarah. And I love that because what it says to us is that it is important and therefore, from the point of view of how leaders bring themselves to the conversation, what they do in terms of their impact on the environment is really important. Had we done this poll, and we certainly have been involved in this for a while now, had we done this poll probably five years ago, we might have actually almost flipped those results. 
Um, in the same way that physical safety has become extremely important to organisations, not just construction, I believe mental health and wellbeing will become equally important and there'll be a lot of time and energy and resources committed to it as long as we all keep it uh, top of mind and continue to have the conversations and discussions about it. Thanks, Sarah. So what impacts mental health and wellness? WorkSafe have identified 11 work-related factors that can significantly impact positively or negatively the mental health of people. And it's things like high and low job demands. And we all know that in our organisations, we have the busy times and the not so busy times. More and more often though, I think what we're seeing is most of us operate at a high job demand level. And there is an obligation for our organisations and our leaders to be looking at those levels at which we work constantly. Some of us thrive under pressure, but we also know that if we sustain that pressure for too long, it can negatively impact us in the form of things like burnout. Equally, you'll see there that a person's choice around how they bring themselves to their role and the way they can show initiative is also incredibly important. There are some other fairly obvious ones there around poor environmental conditions, remote and isolated work and violent or traumatic events that people might witness, I think, to our front line in medical at the moment and think about, you know, some of the things that they're needing to deal with on a daily basis. So you can see there that there is a range of things that can significantly impact positively or negatively our mental health. And by knowing these, we can then start to analyse the degree to which leaders are addressing these from a risk management point of view. Our case study today is construction. And part of the reason for that is that there was a significant study done in 2018 by Professor Luke Downey and Consto from Swinburne University. And what it uncovered was really alarming stats that have allowed for the collaboration of senior leaders in construction to address this. And it has given us the opportunity to undertake significant research to look into it and to explore how leaders and positive culture change can impact outcomes like these. So this is why I'm using case study uh, today for construction. And look at those stats. When this was done in 2018, the white collar professional population, that is those people that tend to work in the design or engineering or leadership spaces in construction, was showing 37% above the norm from the depression, anxiety and stress scale than your, um, other populations. And that included things like surgeons. Um, it included you know, some of the professional services and you know, people that find themselves under significant stress. But you'll see that that was extremely alarming. And along with that, what we also saw was that 50% of the respondents in the white collar population of the construction industry were already meeting the criteria for burnout. 70% experienced moderate to high levels of stress and almost consistently. This research was done by Professor Downey at Swinburne and allowed everybody to really look at it and say, you know, okay, that is just not acceptable anymore. And whilst we've kind of known that's been there, what do we now want to do about it? And this is really the question that we wanted to address. So what occurred beyond that was, a deeper dive into exactly what it was that was creating that state in construction. The six particular hazards that were identified through a significant amount of uh, uh, forums and conversations with individuals from the industry were these six uh, hazards and the factors that address them. So pressure, and again, if you remember back to the WorkSafe ones, it was right there, so therefore, all industries really, and that's about workload. And not sure if you understand, uh, well, you know this, because um, uh, you probably feel it for yourselves, but when we think about globally, the countries that are most impacted by work hours from the point of view of overwork, we often think about countries like Japan or China you know, where we'd expect people to do more hours. In actual fact, Australia is the most overworked country uh, in the world. And I think a lot of that is because many of us go home after hours and get straight back onto our technology. 
It's also because there is a predomination, a predomination, I think, of people who want to work for themselves, not so much for the man. So, and I don't mean that from a gendered point of view, but you know, working for the man um, in terms of the, the cliche that we use there. Um, so subsequently they'll put in a big day's work, they might put in a few extra hours, and then they go home and they do their, their bass and stuff like that. So that's often where that comes in. But from construction, particularly what we were finding was white collar averaging um, more than half of them over 60 hours a week. So this is where we come to that pressure piece. Influence, again, their ability to control aspects of their work and bring themselves um, in terms of choices to how they are autonomous or not. Um, how they are promoted in the organisation, not just vertically in terms of role and level, but also in terms of promoted from an encouragement and development point of view. Their relationships, particularly with their leaders. The clarity they have about what's expected of them on a daily basis and then how change is managed. So if we look at this, we do see some parallels with WorkSafe. But also we start to recognise how then leaders can take responsibility for being able to change that. So from that forum, those forums, from the work safe, work related factors, what we're starting to understand is what people actually want from their workplaces and their leaders and where the gaps currently are. What it tells us is that people want committed and positive styles of leadership. So they can build relationships and have the sort of conversations that allow them to feel safe speaking up. That there are clearly articulated expectations of what they do on a daily basis, how they behave, you know, what their role is, how they add value. That it is a psychologically safe culture where people can feel that they can speak up, where they can add ideas, where they can take initiative, where they can be involved where there is actually clarity about what the organisation does and how it adds value to the world in general um, and also how they fit into that machine. And then obviously that there are quality conversations that allow them to be able to talk about what they need and want and so that they can commit and engage in the general running of the business. So these are the things that we're being told. So when we look at, particularly in construction, the the levels of stress and anxiety that are going on, we get an understanding of what's missing. And this is where we were able to come together with a group of people and look at, well, what do we do to try and resolve that? What sort of solution do we need to put in place that can address it systemically, i.e. top down, to be able to significantly shift something that's impacting a whole industry and quite frankly, no doubt, far beyond that industry. So what a group of us did, and I'll chat about the consortium in a moment, but a group of us came together um, and were successful in receiving funding from WorkSafe Victoria's WorkWell Mental Health Improvement Fund. And what that allowed us to do then was really to explore, as I've shown you those six hazards and contributing factors, but then to consult quite deeply with research, uh, with industry and undertake deeper research to be able to feel confident we had a solution to offer that would actually address the problem. So that was really what we were aiming to do. Consultation with industry was critical and that was done through the Wellness and Infrastructure Steering Committee, which is a, um, the um, important Victorian based people from the top eight construction companies. And we've extended that obviously beyond the top eight. So what's called a tier one level. Um, down to um, a number of organisations and how they are all faring in the wellness space. Also critical to that was still engaging with Luke Downey and continuing to measure the results using the same survey that he used in 2018. So what I wanted to share with you over the next little while was what was the solution we put in place, particularly from the point of leadership, what was the outcome of that? And what can we all learn from that to take back to our organisations? So I'm going to first share with you um, who the consortium was. We've talked about Professor Luke Downey from Swinburne. And if any of you want that original survey, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask for it because we're happy to share that with you. Uh, we also worked with Grant Fuller, who was with, and still is with McConnell Dow 
and he was able to um, offer up a pilot opportunity for us. Grant Fuller is an incredible visionary. He was part of the group that actually started the Wellness and Infrastructure Steering Committee. So again, a really passionate person. And obviously we're supported very much by WorkSafe and WorkWell in this. Lysander are uh, a um, very passionate group who uh, have experience working with leaders um, and in transformational culture. So transforming cultures in organisations uh, by looking at behaviour change, by equipping leaders with the right skills and be, by really uh, looking at culture strategy. So we've got uh, 17 years of history in looking at what actually creates positive culture by creating a wellness overlay to that, what we were able to do then was to look at how leadership impacts wellness specifically. So the pilot group that we were able to test our solution on was the Mordialic Freeway Project. And for those of you that live down that way, um, no doubt you've grumbled a fair few times as you've been struck, stuck in traffic jams around this. It's going to be nine kilometres of new freeway that will join the Dingley Bypass with the Mornington Peninsula Freeway. So it's quite significant. It's due to open at the end of this year. So for those of you who are impacted, hold on. It's going to be brilliant for you when it's, once it's opened. But it has nine quite significant bridges over the waterways, um, Brayside Park. So it's also an environmentally sensitive area. So there's been a lot of amazing work done and some quite groundbreaking work done out there around noise walls, walls and recycled um, materials and looking after the habitat of local um, um, flora and flora. So really great project to be involved on. For our solution, what we also had there was a group of 17 project leaders um, who were willing to be part of this, and 95 white collar professionals. So it was quite a sizable project to be able to test this solution on. So first thing I wanted to do was actually share the results. A um, bit of a spoiler alert, but I uh, wanted to be able to first show the impact, the incredible impact that this piece of work has had. And that way we can talk through well, what was it that led to these sorts of results. What you're seeing here is the three baseline surveys that we did. Uh, the three, um, and again, same survey that was used in 2018 to get the original results. So at the very start of our program, we put the survey in place for the full 95 white collars, and we found that uh, it was ever so slightly, a couple of percentages on each of these, slightly worse than 2018. So what that was telling us was that the industry was actually slowly getting worse. What we did was a follow-up survey um, in January of this year. And then after the completion of our uh, pilot program, we actually did a final survey as well. So what you're seeing there is the incredible results that came through um, from the work that was being done. So things like, and I love the burnout one particularly, 41% improvement in burnout. And look at that. The group down at Morty Alec are now showing 1% better rates of burnout, as in less burnout, than the average population. Now, I would be congratulating all of you out there for saying that's still too high, because I agree. It's still way too high. And we know that Australia does, Australians do work too hard, um, even though we have uh, public holidays for horse races and uh, football finals. But nonetheless, what you are seeing there is that with an top-down, leader-led approach, focusing on culture, we can get incredible outcomes uh, in improvements in things like burnout and depression, anxiety and stress. The other thing, if any of you, and no doubt a number of you have worked on work sites and in construction companies or similar, you'll know that over the course of a project, there are high-risk activities, uh, the lifespan of a project brings its own challenges. So that last, the final survey, one of the things to be aware of is that final survey was done at a time when a number of people were getting notification of their demobilisation or redeployment dates. And that's usually when anxiety goes through the roof. One of the things that was done as a result of the work that we had been doing 
was that the project director actually published those dates, which is rarely done. So people could see ahead of time what their demobilisation or redeployment date was, giving them an opportunity to plan forward. And that talks to that idea of wellness through choices and autonomy of work role and more certainty. So this is where we start to see the impact of those, but I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's have a look at the solution. This is the integrated approach to wellness. Integrated because we need a number of things going on at the same time. Culture change is really complex. So we want to pull numerous levers concurrently. So having a number of activities running at the same time. No doubt many of you who are passionate about wellbeing in your organisation, and we saw in our first poll that many of you do take it extremely seriously in your organisation. No doubt a number of you have wellbeing programs in place. What this one does is it actually makes sure that our leaders are committed as well. So it's not just a bottom-up approach, but what it is is making sure that we are getting input and taking wellness seriously at all levels. So the first part of it was to launch and engage the leaders, help them understand what the expectations were of them, to get them to commit to the full program, agree to turning up um, and understand the process of what was going to roll out. So they had a picture of what was going to happen. That launch and engagement piece is important. And obviously what was helped in that was to be able to do that first benchmark survey and share the results, which were quite startling for them. The next piece was a focus on real leadership and from an individual point of view. So let's look at leadership from where we're currently sitting. And I'm gonna flip forward and backwards a little here, just so that we can see what I'm talking about. The tool that we use is the CLS 360. And what it does is it gives each leader a picture of their perceived leadership style, um, how positive it is, or in some cases, how not so positive it is, um, which actually leads to you know, quite destructive forms of leadership. So whilst it's confronting, it's also debriefed by a qualified professional um, who can work through that and make meaning for the leaders. I got quite a bit of cynicism and um, the guys down on Morty Alec will tell you that themselves if you were to ask them, but I certainly got people sitting there during the launch and engagement that, you know, crossed arms kind of approach where people were saying, Janet, Unless you get the government or the clients to change their contracting, unless we stop competitive tendering, nothing is going to change. When these leaders got their reports and could see that some of their styles of leadership were negatively impacting people's mental health, that's where they were able to sit back and go, oh, my goodness, you mean I personally can impact somebody else's well-being through things like how I have a conversation with them. And this is often where we get that real commitment of leaderships, leadership that they'll often talk a good game and you may be frustrated sometimes by this in your organisation, they'll say the right things, but how do you actually get them to commit? So using things like a 360 degree process allows them to actually see what's going on for them personally and where there might be shifts. So you can see here, you know, some direct reports have, because the 360 is done through direct reports with peers and with direct managers. You get feedback from each of those. You can see then where there's some issues and where there's red, you know, quite destructive styles. We say, you know, that's actually not good leadership as opposed to where there's green and people are getting that sense of good connection, great conversations. They're feeling engaged and inspired. So this is where it becomes a really important uh, tool to get leaders to commit. So you can see there the first and second debriefs of that 360 degree feedback piece is it's really important for them understanding what's going on. And then the transformational leadership workshop that you're seeing there is the one where people uh, explored what great leadership looks like. And in transformational leadership, it's the piece about taking your team on a journey building cohesiveness, understanding the difference between telling and asking, why engaging people is important, how to truly set a vision and create the sort of energy where people want to follow. And as we know that people with, you know, stronger mental health will actually be more productive, which will ultimately lead to greater performance, 
And guess what? That has a result on the bottom line and it's a positive result. So I wonder then, Sarah, if you could launch the second poll um, and let's think about the predominant styles of leadership in your organisation. So I'll just read them through for you. Autocratic, where employees are told what to do, leaders control the outcomes, they can often be quite competitive, uh, even dictatorial, very directive. The second one, democratic, democratic is where employees have an involvement in decision making. They have a voice, uh, they're heard, they get engaged and involved in change. Charismatic, this is where leaders set a clear vision. They get involved early, they inspire action, they support and encourage employees. And the last one, avoiding, and this is often where leaders are absent, where they can be indecisive, uh, they don't tend to step in. Um, a lot of the time people would say they don't necessarily have a backbone. So uh, they're the, the quadrants that are represented in the CLS 360. How are those results going, Sarah? Well, we're almost there. Excellent. Um, I've just waited another <laughs> couple of seconds Terrific. because people are still wanting to vote. Yes. So. Yeah, not always terms that we look at regularly around leadership. And, you know, a lot of the time you're possibly also sitting there thinking, well, some of my leaders are democratic and some are more autocratic and there's one or two that are charismatic. So there can also be a challenge there. Okay, I will share them now. So quite a diverse spread. And again, this is not unusual. Um, what we are seeing there is autocratic styles are what we call quite destructive styles. So 36% of you are reporting that your leaders are quite um, destructive in their styles. And when I say destructive, they may actually have quite a strong blind spot to that. And this is where things like the CLS 360 can be tremendously helpful. And what we found in construction was that... Um, a lot of leaders have simply learnt the style of leadership by observing the people before them. So a little bit like, you know, the louder you yell, the faster the pyramid gets built kind of idea. And what we're now being able to do is shine a light on saying, you know what, that's actually um, really not helpful. Terrific. The next piece is to look at culture. And this is where having done work with the leaders, what we do then is talk very much about what a cohesive leadership looks like and what alignment looks like. So making sure our leadership team is able to have constructive conflict, is able to come together to make aligned decisions and then very clearly communicate those decisions down through the organisation. When we're talking about wellness, it also has a lot to do with establishing the behaviours that we want and that will lead to a desired culture and the behaviours that will no longer be tolerated. So we're setting across the whole organisations and expectations of the sort of behaviours that will lead to strong relationships, that will lead to clarity, that will lead to cohesiveness and support. So it is a really important piece for us when we look at um, how to establish the culture we want. I'm just going to flip through here because what we have is an example of the Mordialic Freeways uh, culture strategy. It's actually double-sided, two pages, and I don't know about most of you, but a lot of organisations have a, a culture, a, sorry, a strategy that is, you know, 27 pages long and it's very difficult to get clarity. What we aim to do here is a double-sided culture piece that anyone can relate to, simple to get a hold of. What the components of this are is the why we exist. And you will see that rather than just saying we're building a freeway, Morty Alex said we exist to deliver a legacy which extends far beyond a freeway, which talks to, you know, happy community, you know, that we've got no impact on the environment, that the people that work on the project walk away feeling like they've been involved in something really important and are proud of it and have positive mental health as a result. So it encompasses more than just we build a freeway. Well, that kind of comes into what we do anyway, but also then looking at the pillars of how you succeed. What are the things that you measure yourself on in terms of success? 
And then probably one of the most critical piece in the delivery of a positive culture is how do we behave? So you can see there what's been done is that there is real clarity for anybody coming into the organisation or working in the organisation to understand what the culture is across the whole project. So whether it's subcontractors, whether it's, um, it's providers, whoever it is, understand what is accepted and not accepted. And this is where we start to get psychological safety occurring. So this is what we mean when we talk about establishing a culture strategy. And you can see there's um, some things that specifically relate to wellbeing here and things that are about the normal um, operational efficiencies as well. The flip side is then about setting priorities, which means that the whole organisation is aligned to what's most important in a given quarter. So um, that can be changed. So this stays the same and the flip side gets updated and changed. We then cascade that down through all teams. So at that point, the 95 came together with their direct managers. So over a number of days, we ran culture strategy, uh, sorry, the team culture and performance, which is where they, they looked at what does it mean to be a team? How do we talk to each other? What are our expectations of each other? And we got some incredibly interesting anecdotal feedback around that which were things like, I didn't realise how toxic the industry was until I sat in a room and we had real discussions, or I didn't realise the degree to which I withhold information until I realised I was safe to, to actually share. So some great feedback that comes out of those. The last two pieces in this integrated approach to wellness were leadership capability development, specific to change and specific to the way that people have conversations with each other particularly related to things like role clarity and career progression. So again, making sure we're equipping leaders with the skills they need to be able to address some of those deeper systemic issues that were seen earlier around what impacts mental health. Underpinning all of that was coaching for leaders. So the most amount of work, and we know it's not easy, but it's tremendously rewarding is when people look at their own behaviour and they're able to work at addressing some of their gaps um, and to shift some of the things that may have dropped into habit and not be serving them well. So this is where coaching comes into place um, to help top up leaders with the behavioural change. And the last piece was embedding, which is them having conversations amongst themselves to talk about the activities that need to be put in place to continue and sustain the culture piece. So I wonder, Sarah, if we could bring up the next poll around culture, have a think about the cultures that exist in your organisations. So do people feel safe to speak up and freely offer ideas without fear? Because this talks very much to the psychological safety in the organisation. Are people still fearful to admit they don't know something or have made a mistake? You know, are they afraid of perhaps being blamed or yelled at or, you know, any form of... Um, uh, behaviour toward them that may impact their self-confidence. And the last one, that you spend time actually working on co team cohesion and building trust and having open conversations, but you may not be there yet. So that's kind of the middle ground piece. Um, as we become more and more informed about what, um, how to help people thrive in the workplace, we understand that that idea of the social connection, even professionally, and the deepness of trust and the ability to have constructive conflict is so important for us to feel safe in putting forward ideas. So that's what we're looking at um, in this particular question. How are we going there, Sarah? Have we got outcomes? We're, go we're going good. I'll just leave for five more seconds to give Lovely. anyone else a, a chance. Terrific. All right, I'll share it now. Lovely. Lovely. So some good work being done there. So 43% of you saying that work is being done, which is great. Well done. We're still looking at 26%. So just under a third where people, uh, sorry, just over a third where people are saying there's still significant fear. Now, if you think about that, a third of our population, a representation of the people that are here, are just still not feeling psychologically safe in their workplaces, which has a significant impact on mental health. 
and that we've got 26%, which is our smallest proportion here, saying that there is psychological safety. Now, that will be significantly higher again than it was five years ago, but we can still see that we've got significant work to do. And partly, I think it's because leaders don't necessarily understand what it takes to create psychological safety in the workplace. A lot of organisations in my experience, and as a leadership consultant, I do get that privilege to kind of be a voyeur on organisational culture. I get to look in at lots and lots of different cultures. Um, so I get to see what works and what doesn't. And what I do see is a lot of organisations have done work on building collaboration and consultation. And it's almost like the pendulum swung a bit too far because what we now see is people being overly polite and not necessarily feeling like they can step into passionate debate because they're concerned about not appearing collaborative. What we want to now do is help people understand that there are good ways forward to be able to build uh, toward building the trust that will allow them to actually have debate and to disagree with each other, but to do it from a point of positive intent. So if people feel heard, they're often very, very welcome, uh, very willing to agree with and align with the decision that's being made, but only when they have been heard. So this is the sort of thing where we start to understand what psychological safety actually means and how it's delivered. So this is a lot of the work still to be done in this space. Talking to this piece about psychological safety, these are the results that again came out of Morty Alec Freeway. And this talks specifically to the behavioural change of the leaders on the project. So if you look at that top one, that there is adequate communication and consultation when change is occurring is an 82% improvement. So that talks to the planning that goes into communication, the participation that occurs by asking people to be engaged in that change. And ultimately what you see is people starting to feel much safer in being part of what's coming um, and you know, exploring that. Um, there's others there, you know, overall, how satisfied are you with your job? We had a 42% improvement in people's overall satisfaction. That senior leadership are committed to leading effectively through change, that there is alignment. I mean, all of this is incredibly visible. I think as leaders, many of us think that if we have a conversation behind closed doors, that it's not seen across the organisation. And yet what we're seeing here is in actual fact, it's incredibly transparent. What's going on in a leadership team is transparent to all members of the organisation or the project, to all employees. And you see here that as our leaders were changing behaviour, there was a really strong sense of that. I like to look at that last one, that you feel safe from any bullying or harassment at work. We didn't train any bullying and harassment workshops at all, but there is a 23% perceived improvement in that sense of people not feeling like, um, you know, to the same degree in an organisation that was run from an authoritarian standpoint, people are feeling so much safer now from that point of view, simply because of the shift that they are experiencing from their leaders. So some really interesting um, stats that came out from a psychological safety point of view there as well. So I thought what might be nice now is to run one of our final polls, which is now to, to get a sense from all of you about what sort of wellbeing programs you've got in place. Because that will allow us again to talk to what does integration actually mean? So Sarah, I wonder if you could run that fourth poll for us. So if you think about what currently exists in your organisation, is it a series of activities that's available to all staff? And often this means employee engagement programs, what I might affectionately call fruit and flu shots, which is, you know, healthy eating plans, free flu shots. Uh, it can be running fitness programs or subsidising the gym. So uh, resilience, and I know, um, and I'll give him a... a Quite happy plug, the Resilience Project. If you've not come across Hugh Van Clydenberg before, a lot of us through our kids at school have come across him. His program is amazing. So if you're looking for a resilience 
program, it's incredible? Um, or is your program more leader led um, around behavioural role modelling with the clear expectations of how we do things around here, i.e. cultural strategy? Um, or is it a combination of the above or none of the above? So, and again, this is not a finger pointing activity, but it is an opportunity for you to reflect on what you've actually got in place in your organisation and therefore know where there might be an opportunity to do different work or to look at it in different ways. How are you going, Sarah? Um, we have uh, nearly there. Just, uh, just wait 10 seconds. Terrific. I get you to speak, Sarah, because I love your accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very strange mix of English and Australian. I love it. <laughs> All right, I think we can end that now. And there you go. Thank you very much. Lovely. Terrific. Um, so uh, it's a big one. We can't quite see the bottom one there, Sarah. I wonder if it's just because I'm not on full screen. Um, yeah, I'm not oh, sure. There it is. Okay. Oh, it's showing. It's there. So, um, and I'm fascinated by these results as well and, and quite um, pleased to see that 37% have that integrated approach, which is both a top-down senior leadership committed uh, commitment and also a series of bottom-up, um, everyone in kind of activities. What I also see and I'm not surprised by is that 41% of the programs through the representative sample here today are suggesting that you know, there is a series of tremendous and no doubt valuable activities for your employees. Um, we don't, and maybe we can do this in Q&A, but what I often find is when there's a series of activities like that, you know, put in place by you know, tremendously passionate individuals, um, they're often frustrated by things like, you know, there's a lack of traction, Janet. You know, I've got all these amazing programs in place and, you know, there's lots on offer, but the take-up's not quite where I'd like it to be. You know, they're not as well attended as I'd want. And what we find is even though they're being offered, um, unless there is that senior leadership commitment and, you know, your, your senior leader, your CEO turns up in his lycra for the bike event that you're running or whatever it might be, that there is still that sense of is this really important or are wellness-related initiatives taken as seriously as they should be in the organisation? So this is where we say an integrated approach talks to leader-led, culturally significant, um, you know, clear expectations, engagement of your people, and then supported by those processes and activities and initiatives um, that a lot of you have already got in place. And it's not until you get those both going that we tend to get the levels of change that we're looking for out of things like the Morty Alec pilot program. So this is where we start to go, aha, that's why it's so important that our leaders are role modeling the sort of behaviors that will ultimately deliver psychological safety and get us to a place where our employees are thriving. It's also, you know, 10% of you saying, you know, I've got none of the above. That's where we also maybe need to start from a, almost a society or community point of view saying, actually, that's not okay anymore. And as I talk to some of the guys that will be redeployed and demobilised off Morty Alec, a number of them are now saying, oh, my goodness, I need to find a culture that I'm coming off as I move into my next project because that's my new benchmark. You know, I don't want to go back to being expected to work 60 hours and not being allowed to go and play football on a Saturday with my kids. So I think this is what's important for us to recognise is that it, it, we can, you know, all become part of that change. So how do good leaders deliver wellness? Just in summary, what we've talked about is we do need that demonstrated commitment from senior leaders. And we, we mean the CEO and down. Or for Morty Alec, it was the project director and operations manager, the most important people on site. Unless they're telling everybody else how important they are, then people will be slightly reluctant to join or not recognise the seriousness of this. Um, so we need that constructive leadership styles. Let's make sure that our you know, senior leaders are not negatively impacting the work that we're doing.
that we've got a really cohesive and aligned leadership team and a clear strategy for how people need to behave. That there are quality connections, both at a team level, but most importantly, between managers and their direct reports. That we're promoting participation, particularly in change. And also when we talk about promotion, that we're having the sorts of conversations where we know what people want from their work and that there are reinforcing systems. So things like, you know, are, are we recruiting the right way? Have we got smart job design and clear job descriptions? So that our systems actually reinforce the culture that we've got in place. And for many of us, we've started the flip way around. Let's put the systems in place. They don't necessarily get traction because we don't have the senior, senior leadership connection point. So that's what we talk about when we very much talk about um, what is uh, the leadership responsibility for delivering wellness in our organisation. I'm aware of the time, but I just kind of wanted to finish with a bit of a takeaway if I could as well. Um, I want to ask you all, how many interactions do you have in an average day? So how many conversations do you have with people? Might be as you come to work and you're, you know, needing to get petrol, grab a coffee on your way in. Conversations with your partner, with your kids, now, then you come to work and you have how many interactions on a daily basis? How many conversations do you have? So see if you can find a figure. Like how many? Put a figure on it. I'm thinking I probably have an average of about 75 interactions a day. And is uh, that enough for you? Yes, sorry, Sarah. I just want to remind people to use the chat to put those responses if they That'd like. That would be fabulous. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, maybe pop a number in there if you can if you can. And I might read them out. To make it a bit. Thank you. That'd be oh, great. If you can. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, Amy said 50, people saying 50 plus. Um, mm. Chris says 50 plus, um, maybe 30, 30, probably close to 100. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 80, 40, 50, 60. It's a lot different from me. I have about two. <laughs> 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 40, uh, 50, 60. You, you're having one with, um, you know. Yeah, I have, I, have more on Thurs, I have more on Thursday <laughs> mornings. <laughs> Love that. Terrific. Uh, 70. So a lot. Yeah, a lot of interactions um, in your average day. So the next question to then ask yourself is, in each interaction, are you positively impacting someone's wellness or negatively? And this was one of the things that really helped the leaders on a daily basis and which I'd love you to take uh, as a takeaway. Think about in each one of those in interactions, are you influencing the move toward or away from positive mental health and wellness? So I think about it from this point of view and I think, you know, have I given you something to think about in a positive way in terms of how you interact it? But also when I was thinking for construction, particularly when leaders kind of went, hmm, so if I go over there and yell at that guy who's just broken that tool, mm, that's moving them away from positive mental health. However, if I go over to him and say, hey, mate, what happened? And engage him in a conversation about what he could do next time to make sure he doesn't break the tool. Oh, gee, maybe I've taught him something. Maybe I've respected him. And gee, maybe the tool was faulty. So this is where we get to that point where we can say to ourselves, hello, each one of us, can be positively impacting the mental health of the people that we engage with on a daily basis. And this is where we all become part of a move towards making a difference. So when we do think about that idea of making a difference and our call to action is that idea of addressing leadership and culture in your, your organisation is a key to building greater mental health and wellbeing and ultimately improving business performance because people who are thriving or have positive mental health, have a growth mindset, are more productive, which leads to, you know, greater results in your organisation. So it is both of those. And if you think about, well, I'm a small organisation, I'm not sure that I could do anything at the scale that Lysander have done at Morty Alec Freeway, you can still think about, well, hey, how do I impact individuals in my organisation on a daily basis through the interactions that I have? So we might um, throw two questions now for a while, Sarah, before I just show the last couple of slides. Uh, yes. And there is a poll. Do you want me to pop that up? If it's easier to do the poll now, that'd be great. 
Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I'll leave that up for a little while because right. we don't have any questions yet, but every time I say that, <laughs> we get them. I'd love to answer questions. Obviously, that poll then is um, to, to ask whether or not you'd like to be contacted. We are very happy to come out and talk to people about the results of the Mordialic Freeway pilot program and what we did, <clears throat> you know, to talk about what you've got in place, what you're doing from a wellbeing point of view, the output as well of the uh, work, Safe Victoria's Work Well Mental Health Improvement Fund is ultimately a framework that will be available to everybody um, free of charge that actually allows you to do a front end audit and get a sense of what's occurring in your organisation um, around, you know, it, integrating uh, activities to get better mental health. So look out for that and we'll certainly communicate it through Sarah as well. That will probably be early September when that's due. Okay. I have actually shared a webinar that's on next week, um, next Thursday. It's Lead for Safety. It's about the model and four strategies presented by Dr. Tristan Casey. Um, and just a reminder that we will be sharing this podcast and webinar um, later today um, once the video has been made. Um, and to keep an eye on those your inbox because you know there's emails can go to spam um i just with some we haven't got any questions but um i just say that alex alexander said earlier um during the presentation janet that it was nicely presented and looking forward to receiving a recording for further reflection on how he can use this to improve wellness and well-being in other organizations that he consults with and we do have a question um it comes up a lot, actually. And Stuart has asked, how do you drive this change when senior leadership is reluctant to provide support to do such? It is possibly the most common question we get, Stuart. So thank you for asking for it. And it is that piece about influence and, you know, how it becomes important and exactly why we undertook some of this research is because even though a lot of senior leaders um, knew it was important until they were actually presented with cold hard facts um, and particularly cold hard facts about what solution needs to be in place to make a difference, they were reluctant to commit resources to it. So I think there has been a real sense of, yeah, I know it's important and I can see what's going on out there, but how do we know what will work? And I'm not going to put money where, you know, it could be, you know, committed to other resources if I don't know something's going to work. So I think more and more, Stuart, is, it, it is to look for the cold hard data that actually says, if you do this, you will get these outputs. I'm also really aware that until we've done this for a bit longer, we won't be able to find the supporting data that will make it even more compelling, such as a reduction in absenteeism, um, improvements in retention, uh, being able to hold on to the great staff that you have. So becoming an employer of choice, Certainly down on Mordialic, uh, there was a, a decrease in what they call regretted losses, which is losing the people that are really important to the delivery of the project. So um, people who might, you know, move to another uh, project before they'd finished. And they did say there was a significant reduction in the regretted losses. And equally towards the end of a project, when people redeploy or are demobilised, they often go early. Um, they've found that people are really wanting to stay to the very end this time, which has been unusual. So that's the sort of data that I think is going to help you to be able to create a compelling business case for your leaders. Um, and as more and more leaders out there commit to this sort of change, I think it will be a groundswell. So um, it's tough for a lot of you working inside organisations to get your leaders to listen. Um, so I think it's about, you know, using every opportunity you have to put data under their noses. Okay. Um... So I've just shared a link to the Lysander website um, in the chat there as well. And we'll also share that link um, details later and the contact details if you have any questions will also be on that email later for Janet. And just a little note that Janet is not so John's. Um, I was just going to mention that earlier. This is a little technical issue. <laughs> um, so all good. So we've shared some links and you'll get an email later today. Um, really like to thank you for joining this session today, Jenna. Lots of great feedback um, from people as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you next week.